across the globe by satellite. Join us for Welcome to Grace, where we'll discover together the distinctiveness of Paul's apostleship through the rightly divided word of truth. Now, join pastor and Bible teacher, Kurt Christ, as we explore the unsearchable riches of Christ. Well, thank you folks for joining us once again. Welcome to Grace. Uh, in our Journey Through the Bible series, we've now come to chapter 12 in the book of Genesis. And uh, we see a fifth beginning here in Genesis. And we did see, uh, we've gone through several of those beginnings. We're now uh, about to enter the fifth beginning that sits in the book of Genesis. Uh, so beginning number one, <clears throat> if we go back and review what these are, uh, the beginning number one was the beginning of redemptive creation. Uh, this beginning had to do with the refashioning, as I like to think of it, the refashioning of the earth uh, in a six-day creation so that the earth could sustain the creature that God's going to utilize to bring the earth back under his headship, back under his, uh, he's going to repossess it, actually, uh, through a willing creation. Uh, we know what went wrong. We're going to, uh, we've already looked at some things that went wrong, but we'll review just very quickly. We'll list them for you. Uh, but God's plan is to reclaim the place from which he originally governed the universe, and that would be the earth. Uh, we discovered at the outset of our study that Lucifer, uh, now Satan, had been in a territory on earth called Eden prior to the redemptive creation. Uh, because Lucifer's role when he was in Eden was the anointed cherub that covered the throne room of God. That's his, that's his position that he held. So uh, we know that he was here. That means God's throne room was right here on earth. That information led us to understand that God's throne room uh, not only was here, but that uh, God left this throne room. Uh, it was here. <clears throat> God was governing not man, not plants, not animals, not dinosaurs, not dragons, not any of those things. But he was, he was, he was leading uh, the head of a universal government evangelic host uh, who you do not see in the six-day creation because they were already here. What we do find out is that they were shouting for joy when God fashioned the earth to put man here so that the earth could sustain mankind. And he did that in six days. Uh, Lucifer was not content with the role that he'd been given uh, in relation to the throne room of God in, the, in that territory of Eden. He desired to have a throne of his own. He desired to ascend, which we're going to be talking about more, more so today. And we see that desire in the five I wills that, uh, that are expressed uh, through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Lucifer's lofty intentions were made obvious in his five proclamations we see in that passage. Uh, let's take a quick look here. For thou, now this is a direct reference to the anointed cherub that covereth. The passage tells us that. For thou, Lucifer, has said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Now keep that phrase in your mind because that's an issue here. And it's going to be an issue. Uh, throughout history, it's going to be an issue. But for thou has said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. This tell us, tells us that Lucifer's elevation declaration, as we see it here, didn't have to be relayed to God uh, in a verbal fashion, such as some form of angelese. I mean, it was not like they were talking back and forth in that sense uh, in this passage, because God knew Lucifer's innermost intentions uh, without Lucifer utter, having to utter a word. God knew his mind. Uh, notice the prophet's words, thou hast said in thine heart. This reminds us of the all-knowing attribute of of God that we see in the book of Hebrews and how intimately God knows the hearts and minds of every member of his creation. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Uh, who is the word in scripture? Well, that would be the second member of the Godhead. Uh, Lucifer couldn't keep his his self-serving aspirations a secret from, from the Most High God because God was able to read his mind. Uh, how people think today that God doesn't know what's in their innermost thoughts and, and hearts and that uh, as long as they just keep that private, God would never understand that. Yes, he does, which is one of the reasons why his son had to die uh, for the shortcomings of mankind. The thoughts God heard coming from Lucifer's mind are recorded for us in Isaiah chapter 14 again in that, uh, in that passage where he said, I will ascend, number one, emphatic position. I will, ascend, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I believe this was Lucifer's goal to rule over the entire angelic realm. After all, um, God had been ruling in that capacity. I will sit also 
meaning along with someone else. Not he would also have an additional desire, but I will sit also with someone else on my own throne upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now, the mount of the congregation is speaking to the seat of God's governmental rulership. It speaks to the location where the supreme ruling power is ruling and reigning. Uh, the psalmist mentions it in Psalms 41.8. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. Next expression. In the mountain of his holiness. Um, God, the commander in chief of the universe, will be ruling and reigning from Mount Zion. Which will be the location of the capital city of the universe in a time yet future. Uh, as well as the as well as the center of God's universal governmental center or operation in time future. It'll be city hall. It'll be the control center of the universe, however you'd like to think of that concept, um, when this time comes about. Psalms 48, 2 says, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. So we know where this is. It's Mount Zion, <clears throat> same place where uh, Christ Ascended, same place where he's going to descend, come back, touch down, rule and reign. And you see what was happening here, though, in this sentence, uh, in this information about Lucifer. He wanted to rule in his own right. He wanted an elevated status or an elevated stature. Uh, he wanted his own throne. He wanted a position equal in power and equal in stature to the Most High God. Uh, Lucifer was setting no limits for himself back here. He had grand aspirations. Uh, from his point of view. Uh, Isaiah 14.14. 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. So we see that word ascend twice now. I will be like. In the sense of comparable to. Equal to. I will be on a par with. The most high God. God who created the universe. So Lucifer. The anointed cherub. Uh, that covereth. Had taken his focus off of his creator. And he had trained his. His uh, focus on himself in a grand, uh, in, albeit sinister, exercise of the volition that God granted, has granted to all of his created beings. Lucifer was created with the right to choose. Uh, the same right God granted the entire angelic host when uh, he brought them into existence. We know that volition, the right to make personal choices, was something that God gave to the entire angelic realm because... Uh, we see in the Bible that a third of the angels followed after Lucifer and his plan of evil to be equal to or on a par with the, the Most High God. And a third of those angelic uh, beings bought into his plan. Others opted. They made the personal choice to remain true to their creator. So God didn't cause, for those who think this may have been the case, God didn't cause Lucifer to choose as he did. Just as he didn't cause the angels uh, to make the choices they made. Of course, God knew the choice Lucifer would make before that choice ever entered Lucifer's mind. Now, God was simply allowing Lucifer, as well as the other angelic beings, uh, the free exercise of their will. God allowed that with Lucifer. He allowed it with the angelic host, and he allows it with us today. Uh, the freedom to choose is something we see throughout God's word because the freedom of choice goes hand in hand with who God is. Uh, both in his attributes, both of love and of justice. Okay, beginning number two in the book of Genesis was the beginning of man. Uh, Lucifer had usurped God's dominion of the earth. God was reclaiming with a lower creation called man and Adam what belonged to him uh, originally. And he gave to Adam and Eve dominion over the earthly realm. And that creation took about... Uh, took place on the sixth day of creation, the creation of man. Uh, then we took note of beginning number three, the beginning of man's sin. Uh, Genesis means beginnings, and Genesis is the book of beginnings. And so if we're going to understand Genesis, we need to understand the beginnings there. Uh, the beginning of man's sin appears in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, the account of the deception of Eve and the willing rebellion of Adam uh, that, we record, that was, are recorded there. Uh, after which came about the beginning number 4, the beginning of mankind's devolution, as we call it, or evolution. Um, the downward spiral of the human race. Uh, we watch the nations, meaning the Gentiles, whose hearts were always inclined toward themselves and self-elevation rather than inclined toward uh, God. Uh, from the account of Cain and Abel all the way through Noah and the great flood of, of his day, uh, recorded in Genesis chapter 6 and 7, and continuing on to the Tower of Babel uh, and the confounding of the common language recorded there in Genesis chapter 11, we were able to see that God was not the focus 
of those who came from forefather Adam. Uh, the focus in the minds of men was always bent, has been bent, continues to be bent on serving themselves, ourselves, rather than serving the one who had spoken all things into existence, the Most High God. Now, what we need to understand is that throughout all this time, the entire first 11 chapters of Genesis, spanning approximately 2,000 years of recorded human history, the storyline has been that of the nations, Gentiles, not Israel. Um, we don't have a nation Israel mentioned in those first 11 chapters. They're not on the scene because they've not been formed yet. Uh, God hadn't established that nation or called out the man from whom that nation would come. So the first 11 chapters of your Bible have nothing to do with the Old Testament, Old Covenant, given to Abram uh, or given to Moses called the law. This is not about a nation. This is about Gentiles, uh, God dealing with everyone alike, no nation Israel in place. Uh, God had not chosen out Abram. And from that man, a specific group of people in order to further his plan and purpose for repossession of the earth. So it's Gentiles. Focus mankind in general. And, uh, and this has been that, that way thus far in the Genesis account. Rather than focusing on who God is and proclaiming his name, uh, re reveling in the glory and the majesty uh, and the supremacy that belong to the Most High God and to him alone... Um, He's the monarch of all things in heaven and on earth, as we've seen. Men were reveling in themselves, uh, as we noted in one of the closing verses in our previous session, Genesis chapter 11, verse 4. And they, Israel? No. Us? No. Uh, the Gentiles of time past, the peoples of the earth in that day, the descendants of Noah's children, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, said, go to. Let's get her done, uh, it may, they'd say in our present day, but go to. Let us... Build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, we can see that issue of being scattered abroad was an important one. But there's an, a more important one sitting here. Let us make us a name. What do we see about a name throughout the Bible? It's the name of God. It's not man's name. <laughs> Uh, what a telling statement there in verse 6. Relatively, six relatively short words in verse 4, I should say. Let us make us a name. Six words sum up the mindset of that day. It continues to be the mindset of the day, by the way. If you count the pronouns in that, in that passage, you'll also arrive at the number six. Interestingly enough, uh, God fashioned man from the dust of the ground on what day? Day six of the redemptive creation. Those who study Bible chronology tell us that six is the number of man. Now you see where they get that idea from, from, from Scripture. Uh, the number of the beast in the book of the Revelation is the number of a man. Uh, a verse there tells us where we see three sixes in a row. Um, is this the mockery of the Holy Trinity um, with a satanic triad, Satan, uh, the false Christ, uh, and the uh, Antichrist, and the false prophet? Uh, could very well be. Uh, for those who like to have a little fun with interesting number trivia, <laughs> 6 times 6 is 36, right? Begin with 36 and add the next number down, 35. Then to that total, add 34. And keep going all the way till you get to number 1 with your addition, starting with 6 times 6. And guess what number you come up with? I know, you can't think that fast on your feet. I can't either. I had to look it up. <laughs> but the number you come up to, with is 666. Just an just a interesting little trivia there. Doesn't mean a thing, but uh, just one of those interesting things you can do with numbers, and you can just do about anything you want to do with numbers. We're told that the number three in Scripture speaks to divine perfection. Uh, does this mean something? Yes. Interestingly enough, and you'll probably see it in our next study, our study through the Bible takes place in threes, a set of threes. Uh, from, from, from major points in your Bible to the next major point, and then you'll see three major points. And when you count the three major points and put them together, you come up with 12. And what's the number of the nation Israel? Now you come to the dispensation of grace, and we see three issues when it comes to the dispensation of grace. Then we see three issues after the dispensation of grace. What are they? The tribulation period, the millennial kingdom, and the new heavens and the new earth. So we have multiple sets of threes here. Um, does that mean something? Well, 
the Godhead is the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That three is definitely important. Creation itself is filled with elements of three. Um, we have time, space, and matter. Uh, time is one, yet three things, because it consists of, of past, present, and future. And it's this way everywhere we look. Space is one, yet three. It's height, width, and depth. Matter is one, yet three. Solid, liquid, gas. We're told in God's word that man is comprised of three things. Body, soul, spirit. The emphasis should be the other way around. Spirit, soul, body. When it comes to the capabilities of man, do we not have thought, word, and deed? Uh, so we see threes throughout when it comes to the creation of God, and he's a trinity. We could go on and on and on with that. Uh, you can find a book on the threes in God's uh, universal creation in the bookstore. Uh, and the things you'll see there boggle the mind. And then one of the older books um, is called The Trinity in the Universe, written by um, Nathan R. Wood, published in 1984. Uh, fascinating book. If it's still out there, grab a hold of it. I, I'd recommend it. Three is a significant number when it comes to the stamp that God put on everything he created. Uh, look that up. You'll find it fascinating. But nothing could be more important to understand than the significance of God's name and the proclamation of that name. Uh, we're not talking about phonetics or sound. Or we're not talking about just saying Jesus. That's not what it's all about at all. Um, it's the truths that are resonant within the name that belongs to God. I should say the names that belong to God. Uh, but when you look at those names, this is, a, this is crucially important to the Most High God. He wants us to know it. He wants us to proclaim it. But that's always been the case through history. He's, wanted, he's had a channel for the proclamation of his name. Uh, it's not only what he, he's called, <clears throat> but in who he is. Because his name speaks to who he is. Uh, resting in the value of and proclaiming the glory of God's name was the responsibility uh, given particular members of the angelic host. Uh, they were to broadcast whom God is. Uh, Lucifer was designed to do that very thing. I think we may have talked about it in, in, in previous lessons. But what we're discovering in our journey through the Bible is that the Gentiles of time past had no interest whatsoever in making God's name known. What did they say there in, in, at the Tower of Babel? Let us make us a name. So you see something contrary here to what God's desire has always been. They were expending all their energies, focusing all their attentions and their efforts on making a name for themselves. They were doing the precise opposite of the words recorded in Psalms 86, 9, where the psalmist wrote, All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify, next two words, thy name. So this is what it's all about. The cry of the Gentiles was let us make us a name. In other words, we'll be something for everyone to see. Uh, we'll be a name and we can accomplish that for ourselves. We'll be a name in our own right. Uh, our name will be our claim to fame, is, is, is how I like to think of it. Uh, that's nothing more <clears throat> than the language of the mindset of arrogant flesh. That's the pride inherent in the sin nature of man, showing itself for what it is. Actually showing itself for what, proving what it really is not. Uh, that which is born in the flesh is flesh, according to John. It'll never be anything other than flesh. Uh, check out John 3, 6 sometime on your own. The flesh is totally incapable of being anything other than the flesh. That means that the flesh is totally incapable of, of being anything on God's behalf, of accomplishing it accomplishing its own righteousness in God's eyes. You could never do it no matter how much you tried. This should remind us of the Apostle Paul's statement in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, all have come short of who God is, all are continually coming short as a verb tense of the glory of God. Um, Romans 7.18 says, for I know that in me that is where? In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. The Gentiles should have been proclaiming what the psalmist proclaimed. In Psalms 113, when the psalmist wrote, Praise ye the Lord, praise, O ye servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. So here's that name concept. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And it doesn't end there. Psalms 113, 3 through 5. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. And it's not Jesus. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above heavens. The name itself is not Jesus. Now the one who came and had the earthly name, Jesus, is 
is the God man Jesus Christ and his name is to be praised but there was a name given to the man called Jesus who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high from this time forth and forevermore who dwelleth where <coughs> on high <coughs> what did Lucifer say I will I will ascend what did the nation say now let us build us a tower that goes into the heavens <coughs> if ever there was a summation statement Relevant, relevant to the uh, mindset of the nations, or we should say the Gentiles, same word, prior to the establishment of the nation Israel. It's that statement sitting in Genesis chapter 11, let us make us a name. God has proven in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis to all who read his word that this was the quest of the flesh in time past. And he's going to prove to us in the remainder of his word that this will never cease to be the quest of the flesh. Let us make us a name. <clears throat> the flesh always seeks to exalt itself. As we continue our journey through the Bible then. God's going to teach us the importance of his name. And the relevance of his name. He's going to show us man's desperate need to have the benefits that are resident within the Lord's name. Bestowed on his fleshly creation. And bestowed upon them graciously. Uh, they won't deserve it. They could never uh, earn it. They couldn't work for it, uh, couldn't barter for it. God will have to bestow the benefits resident within his name upon men, and he'll have to do it graciously if they're to be of benefit in any way to, God, uh, to all the things that God needs man to do and will have man do <coughs> in his repossession plan, both of heavens and the earth. It's God's name and his name alone that's worthy to be honored, praised, and proclaimed in both realms of his creation, heaven and earth. All right, as we've seen thus far in our studies, the nations had no interest in understanding, uh, much less in relying upon who God is. Their interest was in who they were and making something of themselves. What was the result of the thinking more highly of themselves than they ought um, when it came to the nations of time past? Paul sums it up pretty well in three verses in the book of Romans. Romans 1.24. Wherefore God also, next three words, gave them up. To uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. To dishonor their own bodies between themselves. We know what was going on in that day uh, with the nations. Next verse, Romans 1, 26. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Uh, next passage, and it skips a verse, 24, 26, 28. Romans 1, 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. To do those things which are not convenient. So God gave up. In a very real sense. On the nations in general. He didn't give up on them entirely. And forever. Because we see the Gentiles. Throughout our, our Bible. In relation to Israel. But he. The Gentiles. In what way did he give them up? They would no longer be. The channel for the proclamation of his name. Uh, God gave them over to their reprobate minds. The nations weren't the least bit interested. In glorifying God's name. Much less were they interested in resting and magnifying and proclaiming that name. To the point of making his name great in the earth. Um, the realm over which you know the Gentiles had dominion in time past. It was now time for God to introduce a new economy. Uh, a new way of dealing. A new set of house rules. Otherwise known as a dispensation. Uh, in connection with man. And his repossession plan for the earth. Genesis chapter 12 begins that new economy uh, for those keeping track of the dispensations um, God's instituted through time there they are uh, when they're broken down into seven and people have broken them down into many more sometimes less but we do see a new economy a new way of dealing with with that uh, with the affairs of, of a man the, the management of the affairs of a household uh, oikonomia, we hear, see that word economy in it. And this would be the economy or the house rules concerning promise. God's going to make a promise. He's going to make it to Abram. Let's get back to the proclamation of God's name for a moment and the failure of the nations to make his name great in the earth. Now, there's something else very important we need to see here. The responsibility for the proclamation of God's name is what the term elect in your Bible is all about. Uh, and it tie it right into the name of God. I want to talk about that just for a few minutes before we delve uh, deeper into beginning number five, the beginning of the nation Israel. Who had been the first person, the first creation, charged with the responsibility of making God's name great in the universe? 
uh, some of you folks already know, who had been designed to be the primary proclaimer of God's name from the earthly realm. If you're thinking Lucifer, some of you are, you're absolutely correct. Lucifer was the original channel uh, God selected his elect for the purpose of proclaiming his name. Election, for those who may have thought it had to do with something else, uh, is about the various channels that God has used through time for the proclamation of who he is, uh, who, what, what his name means. Lucifer had been given that responsibility in the distant past when he was the covering cherub over the throne room of God. Uh, Lucifer was God's elect in that respect. Now, let's take a quick look. Ezekiel 28, 13. Thou, a reference here to the anointed cherub that covereth, Lucifer, hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now jump down past all those precious stones we see listed there that had been Lucifer's covering to the final portion of the sentence. The workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So God created Lucifer, designed him in a certain manner so he could be the proclaimer of God's name. God uniquely designed the covering cherub who'd been associated with his throne room so that he could be an active and extremely effective proclaimer of God's name. Uh, where do we find that in scripture? Well, tabrets. We know that the word tabrets uh, is the Hebrew tafaf, and it means to play as an instrument, um, which in essence is a sound chamber. So in a very real sense, God designed the anointed cherub, once associated with his throne room, to be an angelic broadcast system, uh, God's resonating sound chamber. Uh, to put it simply, Lucifer was to be an instrument of God for the proclamation of his name. Uh, sounding forth God's name. The word translated pipes there is another interesting Hebrew term. It's the word nekeb. Uh, which means a bezel, such as uh, the bezel that holds a gemstone or uh, from the men out there. The groove, not the glass or whatever you'd call that, the crystal plate, but the groove that holds the crystal cover over your, your watch face is called a bezel. The groove itself is called a bezel. The crystal isn't the bezel. Uh, the bezel holds the crystal cover uh, because, you know, we're looking at the the glass plate or whatever it is, and we're calling that a crystal. If your watch breaks down, what's the jeweler have to do? Well, he has to pry the face uh, of that watch from the bezel that's holding tightly to the face of that watch. The bezel is the protector, the holder of the, of the face of the watch. Um, that's what the bezel does. Uh, a lady with a diamond solitaire, for instance, she knows exactly the purpose of a bezel because the bezel is an important component of the ring that she's wearing. Uh, that the bezel of a diamond ring, or any gemstone that ma for that matter, doesn't have to be a diamond, uh, serves two different purposes. First, it serves a protective function. Uh, the idea is, that idea is resident in the covering cherub statement uh, relative to the throne room of God. Look again at Ezekiel twenty-eight fourteen: Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. The word translated covereth has been defined in a dictionary of the Hebrew by the word protect. Uh, it means to cover over in the sense of defending or protecting, guarding something or someone. Um, guarding what? Who God is. His name. Uh, guarding all that stands that God's name stands for. Uh, standing guard is the idea wrapped up in that term covereth. Who did God place in the Garden of Eden? To, uh, to guard, to protect, to safeguard the tree of life. He placed the cherubim there. According to Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, Lucifer was the covering or guarding, protecting what? Cherub. <laughs> Relative to the throne room of God when, when God's throne room was located in Eden. The bezel of a ring serves that very purpose. The ring bezel protects the gemstone. Do you see it hold on to the gemstone there? So the ring bezel protects the gemstone, has that protective function, serves to safeguard uh, as a safeguard for the stone that it's holding. So protecting or guarding the stone is a major component of the function of the bezel. But what's the second important function the bezel of a ring serves? Think about it. Does, it, does the bezel, is, is it not designed to showcase the setting that it's protecting? Certainly it is. It holds it up in a sense. Um, that is if a designer of a ring knows what he's doing. <clears throat> Most of them do. The bezel holds forth that diamond that it's protecting, holding on to. 
the bezel lifts it up in a sense so that all the brilliant uh, and glorious facets of that stone, whether it be a diamond or whatever, can be clearly seen and appreciated by those looking on. That's the purpose of the bezel. The bezel's de designed in a sense to display the stone it holds so as to showcase or highlight all the glorious facets of that gemstone. This was Lucifer's function as the anointed cherub covering the throne room of God. We just read it in Ezekiel 28, 13. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy bezel, thy pipes, was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Lucifer was to be God's sounding board when it came to the proclamation of who God is, his name, the expression of who he is. This shouldn't surprise us. What do we see the angels doing in the word of God when uh, the angels are associated with the throne room of God? And we don't see it's a cherub now. We see it's something else. Uh, there are passages in scripture that answer that question for us. One of those passages is found in the book of Isaiah, the very book where we read the change of direction Lucifer decided upon with his five eye wills. Notice what the angels are doing in this passage, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah, <clears throat> uh, the year that he died, <clears throat> pardon me, I saw also the Lord <clears throat> sitting upon a throne, high and what? Lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Verse 2, above it, the throne of God, that is, stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and the twain he did fly. Now, we don't see any angels in the stores today, do we, with six wings? Yet here we have an angel being described with wings, and it's six. Now, notice what these angelic beings are doing as we come to verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. They're pointing to God. They're proclaiming God. Uh, we see a similar resounding of whom God is in the book of the Revelation with the angelic host. Again, that are associated with his throne room. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. After this I looked and behold a door was opened up in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. Which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Verse 2. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set up in heaven. And one sat on the throne. Now, who would be sitting on the throne in heaven? <clears throat> so, here we have God's throne. Now, let's skip ahead a few verses to catch the part I want you to see. As far as what the angels being around his throne are doing. Verse 3. And he that sat on the throne was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine. Now, actually, sardinas. Uh, or sardinas is how that would be predicted, uh, pronounced. And there was a rainbow around about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Uh, now, like unto doesn't mean it is. It's like unto. There's a brilliance associated with who God is. Not only a light, but a brilliance um, associated with, with, with God and with his name. These are, are precious stones that are just mentioned there. Uh, they're dazzling in a very real sense. Uh, the sardius stone was a red car carnelian, I think they called it. Dave could tell you more accurately because he knows these things. Carnelian is a precious stone of, of blood red color. Um, it got its name because it was obtained uh, from Sardis in Asia Minor. It was one of the stones in High Priest Aaron's um, breastplate. and a stone in, It's a stone in the foundation of the New Jerusalem, by the way. He that sat on the throne was to look upon like a jasper and a sardius stone. The jasper can have stripes or bands, and it comes in several colors, as you can uh, see there, I think, on the overhead picture. These gemstones speak to the brilliance, the brightness, the magnificence of the glory of the Lord. Uh, so man can look at these, and, and now we see in Scripture that these things are defined as being like unto God in His brilliance and the magnificence and the beauty that belongs to Him. Revelation 4, 6. And before the throne there was a set of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. We're going to see these angelic beings again. Now don't let the word beasts trip you up there. Some people would look at that word beasts and think, how would he call the angelic host beasts? The Hebrew word translated beasts in this passage simply means living beings. That's all it means, living beings. The translators use the word beasts most likely because these living beings are quite different from the living beings to which we human beings are, are accustomed. Verse 8, And the four beasts had each of them, how many wings? They weren't earning them, and they weren't, there weren't two of them. Six wings. 
about him. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest, not day or night, saying literally, setting forth by way of proclaiming, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Now, are they pointing to themselves and boasting about the importance of the role they're playing or how magnificently God designed them with six wings? And, uh, or are they pointing to the Most High God? That's who, they're pointing to the creator of heaven and earth. And they're proclaiming him uh, with Lucifer's built-in tabrets and, and pipes. We can only assume that Lucifer, the crowning achievement of the angelic realm, while the covering cherub associated with the throne room of God on earth, had been given that special role of sounding forth who God is, proclaiming God's name. The tabrets and the pipes were built into Lucifer from the day that he was created, we see in Ezekiel. So Lucifer was designed with a unique capacity to proclaim the name of the Lord. Of course, the iniquity that was found in, in Lucifer was that the anointed cherub stopped pointing to God's name and to who God is. He ceased proclaiming God's name. And he began pointing to himself, the five I wills we, we see, we noted in Isaiah chapter 14. In current lingo, we might say that instead of Lucifer proclaiming God's name, he began promoting his own claim to fame, his name, who he, he wanted to make a name for himself. Lucifer became a self-promoter. Uh, he was selling himself. He became enamored with himself and the brightness of his beauty. And he began thinking of himself more highly than he ought. Is this not precisely what the Apostle Paul warns believers today not to do? Here it is in Romans 12, 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, Paul writes to us, to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure or the standard of faith. That's faith standard, not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Uh, becomes evident in Scripture that Lucifer became a useless channel for the proclamation of God's name. Uh, rather than be a God promoter, uh, a God name proclaimer, <laughs> Lucifer chose to be God's competitor. Uh, what did God do? He changed the channel. He selected a different channel. That's what elect is all about. He chose a different channel through uh, which to proclaim his name. He selected or elected a different channel altogether to make his name known on the earth. At the climax of the six-day redemptive creation, we saw God's human creation, man, being given dominion over all the earth. How well did Adam and Eve do when it came to making God's name great in the earth? Not well at all. They fell for the idea of making a name for themselves, didn't they? You can be as gods. Then we watched the Gentiles who came on the hills of Adam and Eve. Uh, they're... Um, their kids, their offspring that, come, that came along, uh, we watched how well they did when it came to making God's name great in the earth, the realm over which they were given dominion. This brings us right back to Genesis chapter 11, does it not? And they said, go to, let us build us a name. <laughs> and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. Now this tower idea, this tower concept originated right here. This is the tower concept. God is a tower, but this is a different kind of a tower. This is a tower that a creation wants to create for itself. Uh, what did Lucifer say? I will ascend. The first of Lucifer's five I wills was that he would ascend into heaven. Now we have the Gentile nations who came on the hills of man's creation, Adam, saying that very same thing. The Gentiles capped it off by saying, let us make us a name. So we can see the events at the Tower of Babel as an open revolt against who God is, against his name. One writer stated it this way, This act of men in building this city was not only rebellious against God's expressed will through Noah, and that was to, dis to disperse, uh, to replenish the earth. It was also the establishment of man's own attempts to reach out to the heavens and commune with that realm. In this rebellion against God, men played right into Satan's hands. For by reaching into heaven, or unto heaven, they reached out to him, to Satan, and to his principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Now, that's what Gnosticism was about. Uh, in a very real sense, it's what New Ageism is about today. It's about, it's the same thing as superstition and what that's about. There's a hidden force, there's an unseen force at work. It's causing things to happen. You dare not walk under that ladder because that hidden force is going to make something happen to you. Uh, make it sure and blow out all the candles on your birthday cake and then something good will happen to you by this hidden force. Um, 
Let's look at the location. The location of the tower building project of the Gentiles prior to Israel is an important thing to note. The construction took place in the land of Shinar, uh, otherwise known as Babylon. Is it not interesting that the entire human race, save for Noah, his sons, and their wives, uh, wiped out by that great flood, and then, not far down the road from that catastrophic event, we see the multitudes that came from the few survivors of the ark, well, the survivors of that flood, reverting right back to the arrogant, uh, defiant against God ways of those who were destroyed in the flood. It shows you the bent of the mindset of man. Noah's three sons were Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Those were the men who disembarked the ark, remember? One of those sons, Ham, the one who was cursed by God, by the way, had a son named Cush. And the son of Cush was Nimrod. So Nimrod was Noah's great-grandson. Nimrod started his kingdom at Babylon. Now, there's been much speculation about the man named Nimrod. Was he a good man or was he an evil man? Uh, we might glean something because not much is said about that in Scripture. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And people say nothing is spoken there about he was a bad guy. Others say, oh, he was a terrible guy. Well, which is it? We could glean something from his name. The name Nimrod comes from the Hebrew word marad, meaning to rebel. He was a rebellion. He was, he was a rebel. Uh, the, name, uh, the noun form would mean somebody who opposes, a protester, an insurgent, a dissenter. A rebel, somebody who defies authority. Some Bible historians trace the present-day Zodiac uh, back to Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. Uh, we commonly think of the Tower of, of Babel, or uh, Babylon, to have been a spherical or rounded structure, such as uh, this de depiction here by one painter. But that's not really the case at all. The Tower of Babel would have been an ancient uh, Sumerian ziggurat, um, which consisted of a series of terraced platforms, each smaller than the one below it, and all together reaching a great height. That was the idea. At the top would be a shrine uh, to Bel, uh, whom they worshipped as God. Bel was the sun god. They worshipped the sun as a god. That was the sun god and the god of fire. Other sky gods would have been included as well, but it's been suggested that Genesis chapter 11 verse 4 is speaking of a tower and his top with the heavens is the literal translation. A tower and his top, the tower's top with the heavens. These, these folks would suggest is not referring to the height of the tower, but instead to the inscriptions of the stars on the walls of the shrine. Uh, with his, his top with the heavens in that top. Uh, the constellations were, were inscribed there. But uh, with outlines, of course, the Sumerian sky gods uh, 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 on them uh, in order for the people to associate the pictures in the sky as they had known them from childhood with the images Nimrod wanted them to, to worship uh, is the way that it's described. Uh, this is indicative of the occult deception that reigned in Babylon. Uh, rather than constellations telling about who God is and his story, the Sumerians were using the signs of the Zodiac to define themselves. How are they used today? What are you? Oh, you're an Aries or Pisces or a Sagittarius or a Scorpion or whatever have you. But ziggurats were religious structures. These ziggurats were religious. Um, of, they were for the purpose of serving a religious purpose. I came across this statement in my research under the heading ziggurat. You might do that yourself. An example of an extensive and massive ziggurat is the Marduk ziggurat, or also called uh, Itemananki, I think is how they pronounce it, of ancient Babylon, also known as the Tower of Babel. Um, unfortunately, not much of even the base of this ziggurat's left, uh, yet archaeological findings and historical accounts put this tower at seven multicolored tiers, topped with a temple of ex exquisite proportions, uh, the temple's thought to have been an indigo color, uh, a bright red. Well, what was God described at, as? <laughs> so do you see an attempt here to counterfeit? It's known that there were three staircases leading up to that temple, two of which were thought to have only ascended half the ziggurat's height. Uh, Edamananki, the name for the structure, is Sumerian and means the foundation of heaven and earth. Uh, 
It's interesting to me how Lucifer's statement that he would ascend into heaven and the desire of pre-Israel Gentiles <clears throat> to build a tower that reached into heaven, how they go hand in hand. Not that Wikipedia is the most serious, accurate resource for information gathering, but when you type origin of church steeples in Wikipedia on your computer, uh, in the search bar, Wikipedia provides this answer. Towers are a common element of religious architecture worldwide and are generally viewed as attempts to reach skyward toward heavens and the divine. <clears throat> How about church steeples? Have you ever wondered about their origin? Where do they come from? Why, why are church steeples there in the first place? Some folks will tell you, well, Steve, they were brought about to, be, to serve as bell towers. That's all they were, just bell towers so the bell could ring and you'd know uh, it's time to come to church. Others say they were designed to be the high place from which the call to worship could be cried out. In Islam, for instance, the uh, muezzin uh, cries out the call to prayer. Some of you have been over there maybe have heard it uh, from the top of a tower called a minaret. Uh, in many places in the contemporary Islamic world, that call to prayer is recorded and it's broadcast out uh, very loudly. It's broadcast out. Uh, loudspeakers are used instead of an individual. No faith system has the exclusive, though, when it comes to towers pointed skyward. Where did it begin? Babel. Um, <clears throat> some of you are familiar with uh, this famous tower pointed skywards. It's called the Prayer Tower. Uh, where's it located? Oral Roberts University. Sure, Tulsa, Oklahoma. The folks there refer to it as the Tower of Power. Was that not exactly what the Gentiles were doing? They wanted power? We'll make us a name. We'll build a tower into the heavens. Uh, the Tower of Power? We might ask, how so? Uh, what makes prayer from a high tower any more powerful than prayer from a, a lower altitude? Um, the tower at o ORU is 200 feet tall. Uh, is God more accessible from that altitude? We can reach him a little easier because we've gotten a little bit of the gravity. Um, well, steeples of all heights are available for churches today. And, and many folks think that a church must have a steeple or it's not really a legitimate place to go and worship the Most High God. We know that the ancient ziggurats of, uh, of Samaria and Ur, uh, you know, Abram was called out of Ur, <clears throat> were designed for worship of the sun god. We also know that the people of Israel got caught up in the worship of the pagan nations that were around them. Here's an interesting passage from the book of Isaiah. The same book, by the way, where we found Lucifer's statement that he would ascend into heaven. Notice God's words to unbelieving, idol-worshiping Israel at this point. Through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 27 9. By this therefore shall the iniquity of Jacob. A reference to unbelieving Israel. Idol worshipping Israel. By something. Um, that iniquity will be purged. And this is all the fruit to take away his sin. When he maketh all the stones of the altars. He was, he was using. As chalk stones that are beaten to sunder. When Israel destroys those idols. Gets rid of that. The groves and images. Uh, shall not stand up. Because Israel's to do away with them. The word translated images is an, an interesting word. In this, it's the Hebrew word uh, kaman. Uh, kam, kaman. <laughs> like come on. <laughs> the definition of kaman is a sun pillar. A place for sun worship. A sun worshiping pillar. <clears throat> Unbelieving Israel had been worshiping the sun as if the sun were a god. The obelisks in ancient Egypt were built for that purpose. And for another purpose as well. Uh, they were built to symbolize the fertility god. So they were built to symbolize uh, sexuality. Um, you can figure it out. The obelisks, whether they were ziggurats or towers or pillars or minarets, no matter what you want to call them, are nothing more than man's attempt to reach skyward toward heaven rather than the God of the Bible and the reality that he reached downward to man as he enfleshed himself in Jesus Christ and became the ultimate sacrifice for all of men's sins. Every culture has had those towers, and they continue to remain with us today. For instance, there's the obelisk, or the tower of Buenos Aires, Argentina, uh, dedicated to the sun god Ra, who is said to live inside that tower. Can you see it on the overhead? It's a little bright, but it's the best picture I could come up with. There's the obelisks in Luxor, Egypt, and Turkey. Uh, many of the obelisks were designed to, uh, as sex symbols to honor the fertility god, always placed in a circle, another sex symbol. Uh, the obelisk in Ethiopia, and then there's one in 
Mongolia. Do you see these towers and what took place? Where did they have its roots? The Tower of Babel. Uh, there's the obelisk in Amsterdam and the oldest obelisk in Scotland. Um, and you can see that they still remain today, don't they? Uh, there's the obelisk in Switzerland and the one in London called Cleopatra's Needle. Some of you may have seen that. Uh, then there's in, this interesting obelisk in the capital of our nation, Washington, D.C., called the Washington Monument. Uh, interesting, is it not? In the center of St. Peter's Square in Rome, there is a obelisk that's 4,000 years old, a spire known as the Vatican Obelisk. Um, there are a number of Egyptian obelisks standing in Rome today. In fact, there are 13 of them in Rome. More obelisks in Rome than anywhere else in the world, including Egypt. Uh, they were all brought to Rome by various Roman emperors. It was Gaius uh, Caligula who had this, it's a red granite obelisk actually, brought to Rome in 37 AD. Uh, remember an obelisk is a stone pillar or tower. And the first tower we see mentioned in God's word is the tower where? Of Babel. And it was the nations of that time who had brought it into existence. Erected by the nations prior to the establishment of the nation Israel. When the people gathered at Nimrod's Babylon proclaiming. Go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Let us make us a name. The remnants of what began at Babel in the first attempt by humankind to reach skyward. Toward the stellar realm, occupied by the satanic host since the time of Lucifer and the establishment of the third heaven, remain with us today. They've not gone away. Some of our listeners are aware of the fact that Constantine, in A.D. 325, unified the Christianity in his day, of his day, with the pagan worship that's been around since the Tower of Babel. Um, you don't have to look very far to see those remnants and where they are today, um, do you? Uh, I think there are many, we could just go on and on and on. I could show picture after picture after picture. Do we see towers today? Why, certainly we do. We see them everywhere. Most have no idea of the origins of the steeples on church buildings. And we can be sure that the vast majority of church goers today, today are not worshiping a sun god. Uh, um, as those folks were worshiping at the Tower of Babel. Babel, but, or, or God of fertility for that matter. But how many religious folks do you suppose are out there today who are attempting to reach heaven apart from believing the gospel of Christ as proclaimed by the Apostle Paul? Uh, seeking their own elevation and, and way to reach the heavens. How many are worshiping at the altar of religion? Perhaps following uh, ministers of righteousness, the Apostle Paul told us, would be operating during this dispensation in a way that uh, blinds men's eyes to the truth of the gospel that Paul was sent to relay. How many religious folks understand, much less believe, the gospel of Christ today? Um, it's very easy to discover the answer uh, to those questions. Ask the churchgoers that you know uh, if they know what happened to the sins that Christ took upon himself at Calvary and whether or not God the Father was and remains totally satisfied with the payment his son made when his son died once for all sin. Uh, ask folks if they know what was accomplished where their sins are concerned when Christ died for those sins and was buried and then rose again and see what they say. Uh, ask them if they understand the accomplishment of the cross of Christ and their response will give you all the information you need to know in order to discover whether they believe the gospel Paul called my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery or whether they are practicing religion. And where is religion practiced today? In churches with steeples. <laughs> All around us. Were the Gentiles, prior to the establishment of the nation Israel, worshiping the God who created the universe? Were they proclaiming his name? Were they making his name great in the earth at that time? Or were they worshiping God's little g of their own making? Uh, honoring uh, gods of their own invention? From the ziggurats to the obelisks, to minarets, all the way to the steeples, which have become a, a customary part of religion in our day, we see structures pointing skyward, which all began where? At Babylon. And the pagan idol worship of the Gentiles of that day. Um, as if the ziggurat, the obelisk, uh, the minaret, the spire, the tower, the steeple, whatever you want to call it, has a holy significance in the eyes of God. Uh, it certainly had a holy significance when it came to pagan idolatry worship uh, that was significant in Babylon. 
Um, changing the name doesn't change the historical significance. And yet so many people think it represents a holy structure today. It's just not a church. It doesn't have that tower pointing up into heaven. We'll make it official. We'll take that tower that points up into heaven and we'll put a cross maybe on the end of it. And we'll make it official. This is a holy structure. So through the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, God has chronicled for us the effects of Adam's decision in the garden and the reason for Paul's proclamation in Romans 1.21. Because that when they, the nations, the Gentiles, knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. They were not making God's name known throughout the world. They were busy making a name for themselves. So God did what? Gave them up. And this is the first 11 chapters of the first book of your Bible, the book of Genesis. It was time for God to elect, we would say today, select a different channel for the proclamation of his name. Lucifer had rebelled, Adam rebelled, now the nations or the Gentiles fared no better. It was time for God to select a different channel for the proclamation of his name. And that's precisely what he's about to do with this fifth beginning recorded in the book of Genesis. As we enter chapter 12, we're on the threshold of the beginning of the nation of Israel. A new selected or a new elect channel for the proclamation of God's name. Uh, does the Bible not make much more sense when we know what's going on, what's happening and why it's happening, why things are taking place as they are as we go through the Bible? Sure it does. God is proving that man's bent has always been toward himself in elevation, exaltation of self rather than exalting and magnifying and proclaiming the name that belongs to the, one, the only one with that name, and that's the Most High God. Uh, the story of this fifth beginning, by the way, runs all the way through the closing chapter of the book of Genesis, chapter 50, and then it goes far beyond that. In fact, much of our Bible is directed at the select nation that had its beginning right there in Genesis 12, uh, the roots of that nation, um, that elect nation that would be called Israel. God's new channel for the proclamation of his name. Um, we only have a minute and some seconds left here, but um, let's just go to Genesis 12, 1, and get started here. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, he chooses one man from among the nations to form a new nation. That would be Israel. And he tells Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, Abram, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. What land do you suppose God had in mind? Certainly, the territory called Eden, the territory from which God's throne room was located or from where it was located in the distant past. The territory that had been God's house, we're going to learn. Uh, we saw that in our earlier studies. The entire territory of Eden is going to be given to Abram and to his descendants as an everlasting possession. And I will make of thee, Abram, a great nation. Here you have that fifth beginning and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. One quick notation before we bring this message to a close. Notice verse, the wording in verse 2. And I will make of thee a great nation. The key word being I. <laughs> what does that tell us? It tells us that God's going to have to do something where Abram, whose name would be changed to Abraham, is concerned. Abraham would not be, have the capacity to do anything from God for God, especially where God's repossession plan for the earth is involved. God would have to do something with Abram and with Abram's descendants, something they would never be able to do for themselves. Thank you for joining with us in your endeavor to discover the truths in God's Word. Pastor and teacher Kirk Christ and the entire fellowship of Welcome to Grace Ministries would like to thank you for your support of this ministry of grace. If you're enjoying the teachings and want to share with others, please write us at Welcome to Grace Ministries, P.O. Box 90, Penrose, North Carolina, 28766. You may call us toll free at 877-770-7098 or visit us on the web at www welcome to grace.com. Again, thank you for joining us and we look forward to hearing from you.